What's up? It's Ryan over at Two Minute Tennis. Thank you so much for joining me here live. Um, I want to give you a couple ideas on how you can improve your tennis. Uh, and if you have a question, feel free to throw it in the uh, in the comments. So the first thing I want to talk about is height over the net, because I think this is something that completely changes the way people play tennis once they start thinking this way. So when you are rallying back and forth, you can't just think where you want that ball to land. You also want to think how it's going to have to travel to get there. So when you are hitting 100% of the time, you have to know exactly how high. Hey, what's up, Decky? You have to know exactly how high over the net you want that ball to travel. What, what's up, Patheon? What's going on? So here's my question for you. What percentage of the time, hey, Peter, what's up? Hey, hey, love your video, videos. Thanks so much, Ben. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. So I want to ask you, you know, like those watching, I got 40 of you here. This is great. What percentage of the time when you hit the ball, do you aim to a certain height over the net? Greetings from Brazil. Thank you so much. What percentage of the time do you aim, hi, Beverly, a specific height over the net? because it should be 100% of the time. Hey, hi, Chow, what's up? Hey, Adrian, thanks so much. Uh, all nice to see you guys. Hey, thank you so much. So every time you hit the ball, you have to have in your mind the exact height you're trying to make the ball cross island. <laughs> hey, what's up, Shriga, what's going on? Hey, I hope it's going really well. I I'm able to aim 80% of the time with my forehand and backhand is less than 10%. All right, Peter. This is really important to understand definitions, right? Because when, when two people are talking, you have to kind of agree on the definition of the words that you're using. See, I use aim maybe differently. Aiming is mental. It is not execution and physical. Aiming is, let's say you're playing basketball. When you shoot the ball, what percentage of the time are you aiming to get it in the hoop? Well, of course, it should be 100% of the time, but it doesn't go in 100%. So I'm not talking about the execution. I'm simply asking what percentage of the time when you, hi Denise, what percentage of the time when you hit the ball, do you aim to a certain height? Because that should be 100% of the time, right? Uh, yes, uh, Brian, yes, I do. Uh, I, I was just talking about my podcast the other day to my wife, actually. Um, since I don't drive, I used to always do the podcast in my car while driving to the tennis club, but because I no longer work at a tennis club and I do, uh, everything online now, uh, I'm busy making YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and my business stuff. Uh, but I absolutely will get back to that. So I, I really appreciate you listening in for any of you who haven't listened, uh, the two minute tennis.net podcast. I think I've had about maybe 130 or so episodes um, really valuable stuff. So de definitely check it out anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, so here's how you measure certain heights over the net. So as you move forward inside the court, you should mentally aim lower over the net. Oftentimes ple people move inside the court and they hit the ball out and they think to themselves, ah, oh, I hit the ball too hard. If you move forward and the ball goes out, most likely you didn't hit it too hard. You may have, but most likely you did not hit it too hard. I can tell you that Kyrgios probably hits it harder than you do when his goes in. And why? It's because pros know when they move in, not to hit softer, but to aim lower in their mind. So what I like to do actually with my students, I've done this in the past, is take a helium balloon with a long string and connect it to the net and bring it very close to the net and then have the student try to hit the balloon that's right above the net, giving them the mindset of hitting low. As you move back, and let me make sure you can see this. Okay, good, you can see this. As you move back, you need to aim higher over the net. What typically is done in recreational tennis is as people move forward, they hit softer, and as they move back, they hit harder, when what you really wanna vary is the height. So as you move in, 
aim lower and practice hitting lower over the net, almost aiming for the top tape of the net. And then as you move back, aiming higher and having more of a like Rafa Nadal kind of moon ball idea, right? So every time you go out and play, it would be a great idea if you just spend a little time when you're practicing, varying the height over the net. I was talking about that helium balloon on a long string. Stand back with your coach, stand back 10 feet behind the baseline with your coach and have the string, have the balloon about 10 feet up over the net and try hitting the balloon from standing 95 feet apart from each other. You'll be shocked that as you move back, you can hit quite high with spin and speed and the ball still lands in. All right, let's answer some questions here. Let's what we got. Hey Ryan, question. I play very high level tennis in Holland. With your tips, my game can still improve. I struggle my strikes, uh, a lot of po uh, power, but how can I hit harder? Have a lot of power. Yeah, so, um, Here's one thing that might actually seem counterintuitive. Be sure to not jump as you're hitting the ball. Oftentimes players jump and they really lose that ground force. If you watch the pros, especially if they're standing still, right? If they're on the run, it can be a little different depending on the stance they use. But if you're stationary, uh, do not jump. You watch Federer, he'll keep one foot on the ground. Nadal, they'll keep one foot on the ground. So really feel connected with the ground in order to be able to use the energy and pass it through to the racket. So be sure not to jump. And I think you're going to see a difference in the power level that you have. Is tennis season again? Let's see a great. That's amazing. Time to put some of this into practice. Thanks for the advice. You got it. No problem. Uh, as I said before, uh, that's an amazing tip. Thanks. I will check it out. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, how can I fix my backhand? Always lands near the service line. I want to make it longer. Yes, I understand Monfils jumps. <laughs> You're right. And, and I used to tell my parents that I had a friend who never studied for tests and they always got A's, but is that something that we're going to copy, right? So I'd rather copy Federer than Monfils, right? Um, for any of you who are commenting, it would mean the world to me if you watch any of my videos, if you left a, a super chat or a super thanks um, and that's just a little tip that you can leave for me if uh, the tips that you find uh, on my channel or anywhere else on social media mean, uh, and, and mean something to you and are helpful. So thank you so much. Um, we, somebody was talking about the two-handed backhand. So let me actually move the, the tripod over here. I want to help you to hit more depth on the two-handed backhand. Somebody was talking about the ball landing very short. When you are hitting a two-handed backhand especially, Something you can do is actually to copy uh, Taylor Fritz. So Taylor does not bend the elbows early and touch the back. One of the things, if you watch him, he will actually extend and just hold the racket out. If you're struggling with depth on your two-hander, try after you strike the ball, continuing going out and just stopping out there. It's the craziest thing. When you go out, you penetrate and push the ball through the court. If you're going up too much with a bicep curl, like you're doing a bicep curl, then the ball tends to get too much spin for the amount of penetration you had and the ball ends up landing short. So what I like to tell people is, after you hit the ball, feel like you're handing your racket to your opponent. So hit and hand your racket to the opponent. Taylor Fritz does this so often. I would say when you watch him practice his backhand, uh, I would say 40% of the time, I think that's too much. I would say 30% of the time, he does not go to his back, but rather he just hit, hits and he extends out. And from the back, it looks like this. He actually has the racket still to the left of the hand. That's called the left side of the letter V. He's got the letter V. So he hits and he stops like this. That penetration into the back of the ball really sends the ball deep. That was a great question. I had it deeper on the two-handed backhand. Again, if these tips are really helping you, it means the world to me. We had an amazing session about last week. There were so many super chats and, and, uh, and super thanks. So thank you so much. Um, is starting at 13 years old late? No, <laughs> of course not. Tennis is a lifelong game. You, you, don't th I'm 43. 
I have as much energy as a 13 year old. This is what you'll learn as you get older. You feel no different than you did when you were younger. It's just how it works. Uh, thank you so much, Shregan. Let's see what we got here. Uh, a drill to hit the ball on the rise. My kid always waits on the baseline for the ball to come. Yeah, um, so one of the things you have to learn in order to take the ball on the rise is to drop the racket down with the ball. Drop the racket with the ball. Let me explain. So the reason players struggle taking a ball on the rise is because they wait for the ball to bounce, then they swing. Let me tilt this down a little bit. We got 57 people on here. This is awesome. When a ball is coming in and you want to take it on the rise, you want to drop the racket with the ball. If you turn high on a forehand, for instance, and you wait for the ball to bounce, it's going to rise as you swing and try to hit it. You will never get to the ball on the rise if your racket's up and the ball is already bounced. So as the ball is coming down and bouncing and coming back up, you want to drop the racket with the ball. That way, once it bounces, you're taking it on the rise. So it might not be, it might not be that they don't want to take it on the rise. It might just be they're not dropping with the ball. I've made many on the rise videos on YouTube here. Uh, just type in the search bar in YouTube, two minute tennis on the rise. And there will be many videos teaching it. And you'll see how I use the pros and myself to drop the racket down with the ball. I drop the racket with the ball. And when you synchronize the ball dropping and the racket dropping, taking the ball on the rise is very, very simple. All right, let's see what we got here. Let's see, we got some questions. <clears throat> what is my full name? <laughs> Ryan Reedy. Um, how do you toss when it's in the sunlight? Yeah, Shregan, so that's not easy. Um, I know that you have, thanks Jim, I really appreciate it. Um, I really have, uh, or uh, your serve, Shregan, you have a very low toss. Uh, one of the things I would actually practice, Shregan, is to practice serving with your eyes closed. As funny as that seems, when I serve, uh, <laughs> thanks so much. If it works, you'll pay, that's good. I'm uh, still watching your live stream. Holy geez, it's 2.32 in the morning. Uh, that's amazing. I think you're, you must be 13, you're 13 hours ahead of me, except it's at the same time. Um, so Shregan, what I would actually recommend for learning to toss into the, into the sun is to, you already have a low toss, but I would actually practice closing your eyes, not when you're actually playing a match. What we're trying to do is make it so that you know exactly where the ball is. You can serve with your eyes closed. It's one of my favorite drills for myself and for my students is to have them practice serving with their eyes closed to prove that they don't actually have to see the ball. One of the things is you, you'll see people toss and they're looking for the ball. When you serve, the moment that ball goes up in the air and you're hitting it, if you're blinded for a second, then it actually helps if you already know where the ball is gonna be. So I would practice serving with your eyes closed as funny as that is. Um, and I think it'll actually work to your advantage to be able to serve when you're tossing into the sun and you're squinting and you can't really see well, you've already grooved it. I, I bet you could take Tiger Woods and have him close his eyes and he could hit a perfect tee shot because they, they know where the ball is. So it's kind of that idea. Hey, Coach Ryan, a quick question, quick tip on how to hit a backhand because whenever I'm playing, the ball always goes out. How can I close my racket and ensure that I don't hit it out? Great question. So the grip systems are how we control the racket face. So it's really important that you take your right hand and you turn the right hand. Now, what you can do to change the grip is actually to rotate the racket. Rather than thinking of change the grip, think of rotating the racket or kind of like you're grinding pepper, like a pepper grinder, you, um, you can do both. So you can turn the hand and turn the racket at the same time. If you are not changing your grip on the backhand, then it becomes more difficult to close the racket. Now, if you are changing the grip, then what you wanna do is connect, you wanna connect the, um, the top hand with where the racket is pointing. Let me explain. When you hit a top spin backhand, what we want to do is tilt the strings down, right? So we, we start in our ready position, we take the racket back high, 
we drop the racket. Now, as the racket drops, it shouldn't drop like this. Let me show you this from the back. The racket should not drop like this. I shouldn't be able to take a coin and balance it on the edge of my racket. That is not what we want because if the racket is straight up and down, then when I get to the ball, my strings are open and the ball goes out. So what we want to learn to do is tilt the palm down toward the ground. If you tilt your palm down toward the ground, then you're going to be able to spin up the back of the ball. So grip change, take your bottom hand and turn it to, you know, to a continental grip. You're going to keep the racket up on the way back. When the racket drops, it can't drop like a butter, like butter going or a knife going through butter. But you have to kind of mash potatoes and you got to tilt the strings down toward the ground, then keep them down and then spin up the back of the ball. So change the grip and feel your top hand tilting down toward the ground and then keep it that way to be able to spin the ball and bring that ball shorter. It's kind of the opposite idea. Somebody was just talking about their ball always lands short. You're talking about your ball always goes long. So we got to hone those in and figure out how to kind of meet in the middle. Watch many of your videos to improve racket drop. Uh, even worn the birthday hat in public. A any other small tip? Um, yeah. So what I would say, Jim, is I, I was filming a video uh, earlier today. It was the video I just put up. It was like the different tosses. I was just filming that uh, this morning. And the, the guys next to me, uh, you got it. So happy. So happy. Um, Jim, the guys next to me were a perfect example of players who looked really good before they hit the ball and then they struggled with their technique after they hit the ball. It's as if, if you could look at a timeline of their forehand, the level of their forehand, the level of their technique went down and got worse as they went through the stroke. So what I would say, Jim, is with every single shot you hit, hold your finish. This would be no, no different in basketball where they tell you to hold your finish like your hand is reaching in a cookie jar. A golfer who hits and just holds and, and just sits there, I want you to hit forehands and hold your finish. If you have to hold your finish, you're gonna hold a good finish. But you see a lot of people, they look like this before they hit the ball and then they go like this after. And they look like this before they hit the ball and then they look like this after. So on every forehand and backhand, this is just an easy time to do it. Rally back and forth with someone and when you're done, just freeze. On a forehand, catch the racket with your non-hitting hand. On the backhand, you can stop out in front for more depth or if you want to touch your back for more of a, um, a powerful swing and a faster swing. But practice hitting forehands and backhands and holding your finish for just a second. You can think of it as don't move until your ball bounces. Um, now, that's not really something that you can do in a match, but it is going to make you, um, uh, it's going to improve your follow through. And a lot of people, they say, oh, the follow through is not important. Yes, it is. Because what you do during contact is shown in the follow through. So if you have a great beginning and you have a great ending, it's like a row of dominoes. And if you know that the first domino knocks over and the last domino knocks over, then all the other dominoes must have knocked over. So if we can control the beginning and control the end, then the middle is going to be very good. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, 100% agree. Use swing vision for that exactly. How to mentally stay intact after double faulting. I tend to check out. Yeah, I mean, it, here's the point. Um, so you have to know the percentages of the points that you need to win in order to win the match. Does anybody have an idea? Uh, I've been in your channel all day. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, so for all of you watching, take a guess right now. What percentage of the points? Oh, here, here's, a, here's a great question. Rafa Nadal has dominated the French Open for the last 15 years, right? What percentage of the points has Rafa won at the French Open? Jim says 52%. What percentage of the points has Rafa won at Roland Garros for the past 15 years? If you take every single point he has played, what percentage of the points has he won? Now, realize something. This is how you dominate a tournament. The answer is, we have some good guesses here. The answer is 
56%. Now, all of you who wrote 55, that is a very smart answer because 55 is the percentage of points that the pros win when they finish year end number one and they dominate. Uh, you know, they, they win two or three Grand Slams. But over a career, Nadal has taken that 55 and he is winning one extra point per 100 points. And he is dominating the French Open because he wins 56% of the points, not 55. Now, here's what, here's what I, what we need to understand about that. You have to be willing, if you want to win 14, uh, uh, 14 Roland Garros, I don't know how many he's won. It's got to be 14 by now. Is it 14? Somebody tell me, please. Um, you have to be willing to lose 44% of the points. So somebody was asking, how can I stay mentally focused when I double fall? Well, you're going to lose points, so who cares how you lose them? And in fact, you're going to lose at best, 44%. I mean, then you're like Nadal, right? So you're not going to win a tennis match without losing points. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a Wimbledon final, I believe, I believe that uh, Sampras won the final, and I think he had 13 double faults in the final. And that's because he went for such a big second serve, too. But 13 double faults, and he won the, he won the final uh, and won the Wimbledon title. So Put it in perspective and just say, well, that's that's one of the 45 out of 100 points I need to lose to win this match 6-3, 6-3. And just let it roll off your back and go to the next point. It's 14. Thanks, Shregan. I appreciate it. Guys, if you're loving this, um, this live stream and any of my videos that have helped me, it means the world to me and my family. If when you leave a comment, you also leave a super thanks. Uh, just a little tip, like a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. I think they have the, the de denominations there. It means the world to me. So thank you so much. How do you hit a, a high one-handed backhand? Great question. So the high one-handed backhand, uh, and yes, I'll show you the close-up of the, of the, the grip. I'm going to show you both the one-hander and the two-hander. A high one-handed backhand, you can hit a slice. You can hit a slice, absolutely. But you want to think of swinging from a very high position, so don't turn low. You got to turn high on a, one, on a high one-hander. You want to think of swinging, if you're right-handed, up to the right. So don't swing down to the right or across to the right. Think of swinging up to the right. Now, I'm, I'm in my basement, so there's, really, there's a low ceiling here, so I can't, um, I can't demonstrate it. I guess I could demonstrate it while kneeling, so check this out. So there you go. So I want to go up from here to here. So you're thinking of almost putting side spin on the ball, but it's like a top spin side spin from bottom left to top right. Um, another thing on the, the backhand is, how do I get a, a better at volleys? I'll give you a, a tip here. Uh, uh, another thing about the high backhand is to not aim low. When you get a high backhand, I don't care if it's a two-hander or a one-hander, Aim high. Do not drive the high ball. When you drive a high ball, what you end up doing is hitting the net. Because we think, well, it's high. Well, it's not that high. I mean, it's high to us, but it's not high to the birds, and it's not high to planes and trees and to Superman, right? It's not high to them. So it's only high to us. And to the world, it's low. So we still need to lift that ball. And so players often get a high ball, high forehand, high backhand from behind the baseline, and they think, drive it. How do I drive this ball? That ball ends up just dropping into the net. If you take a ball and you roll it off a table, the moment it leaves the table, it starts going down. It doesn't like just fly through the air like a bird. It doesn't. So the moment it leaves the table, it starts coming down. Well, if you hit flat into the ball, the moment it leaves your racket, it starts going down. And if you're far behind the baseline, that ball is going to hit the bottom of the net or land before it hits the net. So you need to hit high balls up. So lift high balls. And I think that's gonna really help you to swing up as you're hitting that high one-handed backhand. All right, let's talk about the grip. So first off, we wanna know and understand the grips. Yeah, you got it. I love going live, by the way, I love it. Jim, thank you so much. Jim, you are, you rock. Thank you so, so much. That is so kind of you. 
Thank you. Honestly, thank you. So let's talk about the grip. Jim, you're the best, man. Thank you so, so much. So let's talk about the grip. You have two spots on your hand, the base knuckle of your index finger and your heel pad. Now, here's what I've noticed. Oh, Jim just wrote something. Hey, just tr trying to support for your quest. By the way, I was asking about racket drop on the serve. You got it. I'm going to answer your question. You got it, Jim. Jim's like first priority right now, but let, yeah, there you go. But let me answer, let me talk about the grip and then on the backhand, and then I'm going to uh, go with uh, go with Jim's question on the racket drop. So many players know about the uh, uh, base knuckle of the index finger. Like this is what people focus on, but you have to have another place on the hand. Otherwise, where like how do you position your hand? You can see I'm pivoting on an eastern forehand. My knuckle is staying on panel three, but my heel pad and my hand are all over the place. So you gotta have two places on the hand. And that's why we have to have the heel pad as well. So when it comes to a two-handed backhand, we want to use panel number two. Now, I call them panels and not bevels. And the reason is I've been coaching for 25 years and I realized People don't know what a bevel is because people think bevels are corners. They think that this is a bevel and this is a bevel. That's not a bevel. A bevel is a flat side. So I started calling them panels. In fact, I asked my wife who has played tennis zero times in her life. She's never, she's never even hit a tennis ball in her life. And I said, honey, what? What word do you think is easier to understand? Because I went right to the source, someone who doesn't know anything about tennis. And I said, would it make more sense if I called these panels or bevels? And she said, oh, panel. I don't even know what a bevel is. Like I would get confused thinking it's a corner, you know? So uh, we want to know the panels, right? So this is panel number one, the very top. And if you're right-handed, count to the right. If you're left-handed, count to the left. So panel one, panel two for a right-hander is the 45 degree angle panel. Then panel three is right here, right? So we're gonna take our right hand, if you're right-handed, the bottom hand for a two-handed backhand, and we're gonna take these two spots on our hand and place them on panel two. That's the continental grip. So we can turn the racket to help the grip change occur. So we can take our hand and turn the racket at the same time. You can see I'm turning my hand and turning the racket and I like I'm grinding a pepper grinder and that helps me change the grip. So my knuckle and my heel pad are on panel number two. The left hand, same thing, knuckle and heel pad. We're gonna put them on panel number, well, if it's your left hand, that's called panel three. If you're using the right-handed, that's panel seven but we can count to the left for our left hand. So it's panel three. That is an Eastern backhand grip. So we have the, I'm sorry, Eastern forehand grip, my fault, on the backhand. So we've got the right hand as a continental, the left hand as an Eastern forehand, and that is the grip. When it comes to the one-hander, I teach the really conventional, basic Eastern backhand. And that is the knuckle and the heel pad on panel number one. So this is panel one, the Eastern backhand for you righties. This is your continental. This is your Eastern forehand. This is your semi-Western forehand. And this is your full Western forehand. Got it? All right. Now, Jim asked about the racket drop. Let's see here. Uh, doo, doo, doo. Let's go to Jim. I'm trying to find Jim's question on the racket drop. Jim, did you ask? I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. Uh-oh. Oh, small tip for the racket drop. Okay, cool. That's all he asked. Okay, cool. No, I knew what you meant by the, uh, by, by, uh, the racket drop. So the racket drop is a result, Jim, of two things. It is a result of the most important power source on the serve, which is the elbow driving forward and up. And it is also a result of leg drive. But let's not worry about leg drive right now. Let's worry about the most important thing, which is the elbow. When we use a racket drop, what we're looking to do is to create a circle. You can see that my racket is traveling 
in 360 degrees. Just look where my racket is in space right now. And now watch. Look where it is again. My racket is traveling in 360 degrees. Now, how am I doing that? Look at my elbow. The racket drop is a result of taking your elbow, which is going back like you're elbowing someone, elbowing someone behind you, and then as you go, where's my birthday hat? Here we go. As you bring the racket in over your head to knock off the birthday hat, your elbow drives up and the racket goes down. What you do not want to do is drop the racket down. When you drop the racket down, it has nowhere else to go. It's a real, really common mistake. Players will just shove the racket down the back and their elbow stays in one place like they're doing a bicep curl. That's not what you want. You don't want to shove the racket down. What you want to think of is after you toss, elbow someone behind you and then point the elbow up at the ball. So watch this again, Jim. Toss, elbow someone behind you. And by the way, you can see the tip of the racket's pointing down. Then I hit the birthday hat off my head as I drive my elbow up. When you do that, that's what throws the racket upside down and then you get the racket drop. If you are, if any of you watching are trying to drop the racket down, the racket has nowhere else to go because once it goes down, it's gonna stop. The racket drop is part of the elbow coming forward and up. And once you go elbow driving up, then you can swing. Now here's a drill that you can practice to learn how to get the, the elbow to drive up. So for perspective here, I'm serving that way, right? So I'm hitting the serve that direction. What you want to do is almost like you're saluting, right? So I'm like this, and I'm going to toss the ball, and I'm going to get my elbow out in front of me and have the ball land in my elbow. So watch this. Toss, and I get the ball to land on my elbow. I am learning how to move my elbow. If in your mind, your focus is on your hand, you are not going to make the racket drop. What we want to do is elbow someone, hit the birthday hat, and then drive the elbow up. So the hand is not leading to the ball. The elbow is leading to the ball. So have the elbow behind you, toss, and have the ball land on your elbow. Now, the toss is not mimicking the actual toss on a serve. The toss in this drill is just giving the elbow a place to go. So if any of you are struggling with the racket drop on your serve, I want you to really focus on the elbow. In fact, one of the more difficult things to do, I know I struggle with it because I'm not super flexible. One of the most important things you can practice is uh, filming yourself from the back and having your elbow higher than your hand. Most recreational players, their hand is always above the elbow. Watch the pros, their elbow is higher than the hand. And that's what actually throws the racket off to the right. You see um, John Isner and his racket is off to the right of his hand. So it's toss, elbow someone behind you, and as you hit the birthday hat, point your elbow up at the, the ball. Now, the reason the uh, leg drive helps, uh, it helps slightly uh, with the racket drop, is when the racket begins to drop, if you explode up with your body, now the body is going up as the racket's going down and it stretches the shoulder even more. And then, man, it's like, um, it's, it's like uh, when you're a kid and you got mashed potatoes and you fling the mashed potatoes at your brother and then you get in trouble, but you go bam, right? So it's, it's, like a, it's like a catapult and it lays back a slingshot and bam, right? That's what you want. You wanna drive the elbow with your legs going up, that stretches the shoulder and then it snaps up over the arm. So I hope that helps. You really wanna focus on elbowing somebody behind you and then driving up with the elbow. That creates the circle and then the racket just whips. It's, it's almost like, um, it's like a lasso. It's super loose and circular. You want to think of the service circuit. Thank you so much, Sylvia. 
Thank you so, so much. That is so kind of you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks so much. I, I can tell you this. My, my wife and kids will tell you that I'm a better husband and father when I've coached tennis that day. Um, I, 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 I'm not saying I'm the best tennis coach, <laughs> but I'm the best version of Ryan when I've coached that day. I love coaching tennis. Like I get so energized by it. It's so much fun. I, you might, you might, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny that I'm going to say this. I, um, I find playing tennis boring <laughs> and because I compare it to how I feel when I'm coaching. And if I had to give a lesson and coach or play tennis, I'd be like, Ugh, I got to play. I'd much rather coach. I know. It's just kind of like what I, what I love to do. Um, wish you live in Illinois. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Well, for any of you watching, just so you know, I do live Zoom lessons with people all around the world. I give 11 Zoom lessons a week. Um, my schedule is completely packed. I, I give three lessons on, uh, Tuesday, on Tuesdays, three lessons on Wednesdays, three lessons today. Uh, I already did those. And then I have two lessons I do on Sunday morning. And I, people, I teach people all around the world. So if you would like me to help any of you with your serve, your forehand, your backhand, your match strategy, whatever, just film yourself hitting and go to my website, twominutetennis.net, sign up for a live Zoom lesson, or you can do, thank you so much, Maria. You're amazing. You are amazing. Jim, Sylvia, Maria, thank you so much. That is so kind of you. And you can sign up for a live Zoom lesson where it's just the two. Uh, the, the live Zoom lessons are $120 for an hour. They are the best tennis lesson you will ever take. Thank you, Jim, so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, the, the, the reason the Zoom lessons are better than any in-person lesson you can ever take is because you're at your house. Um, uh, you're at your house, and when you sign up for a Zoom lesson, Jim, you already signed up for a Zoom lesson? Amazing, amazing. So Jim, right, Jim, right, he's going to send me videos of his serve or his forehand or his backhand, whatever he wants to work on. And then we meet live on Zoom and I put on my phone, I share my screen and I put Jim side by side with Nick Curios or Roger Federer or whomever, right? I put him side by side and I teach him everything he wants to learn and practice in order, the steps that he needs to work on them uh, in order to hit much better serves. You can't do that in an in-person lesson. In an in-person lesson, you're gonna walk away with like one thing or two things. If you take a Zoom lesson, which is, um, which is recorded, by the way, you get a recording of it afterward, I teach you all 10 things that I would want to teach you over a five, six, seven uh, lesson package in person. So you buy one lesson, you learn everything that you need to practice, and then with the Zoom lessons, you send me videos every week of you practicing what I taught you, and I respond back by email or text or voice message, whatever. Um, thank Wayne, you're amazing. Thank you so much. We got Wayne and Sylvie. Oh my gosh, Maria, this is amazing. Jim, thank you so, so much. Um, so the live Zoom lessons are better than any in-person lesson you can possibly take and I truly, truly mean that. Uh, so go to twominutetennis.net to sign up. What's your favorite uh, with the service? To place your right foot nearby the other foot? Uh, yeah. So when it comes to the pinpoint or the platform, uh, I, I don't mind either. Um, if you feel stuck, I, I've had students who feel stuck. Uh, so I ask them to toss and then bring this foot in. The moment you toss, by the way, you want to start bending the knees and going like this and bringing the back foot up. I know some people toss super high and then it takes them forever to bring this foot in. You want to think of a low toss, bring that foot in and then go. But one of them is not necessarily a favorite. Um, I don't use a pin, pinpoint stance. I use a platform, but there's precedent for all, uh, you know, for all pros using one or the other. So it's fine. Uh... Here we go. When pros are about to return serve, why do they look back and forth between the racket and the opponent? Oh my gosh. That, so I do a little interpretation of Novak Djokovic on the return of, or um, uh, uh, like uh, I, I copy him. So he goes like this. He goes. 
<laughs> like in his head. He got so funny that he looks at the racket and looks at the ball. Um, I have no idea why he does that. I have no idea. I think um, it might actually be just to uh, focus in close and then look far away and then focus in close and then look far away. Um, I think they like having something close to look at. It also might just be that it's a little uncomfortable to be bent over and, and athletic and then looking up. So it might just be like a little relaxation and then they look up again. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I would have to really pay attention to myself if I do such a thing. Thanks for all the help. You got it, Nathan. Uh, favorite strategy to play in a tiebreaker. Uh, when is when you're winning? What is when you're losing? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, great impression. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you so, so much. Um, you know, the, the first thing is a lot of times players can become very, very passive. I, I, I'll just give you what works for me. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, change what you've done to that point from the standpoint of all of a sudden, like if you haven't served and volleyed, now all of a sudden you're just going to start serving and volleying. I wouldn't necessarily do that. But I would stay aggressive with your racket speed. I think it's very common that players get nervous and they start slowing their racket down. So if you can be someone just in the tiebreakers, if you can be someone who just makes sure that you have racket speed, first serve, second serve, your ground strokes, that you are moving your feet, because again, you can get nervous. And when people get nervous, they stop moving their feet. Move your feet, keep your racket speed high, and stay super positive. Because unlike a game, where you can win a lot of points and then they're there for naught. It's funny how often people go down 5-2 and then they can come back and win the tiebreaker. We, the, the, no lead is safe in a tiebreaker. So stay super positive, keep your feet moving, and keep your racket speed up. Do not slow your racket down. Uh, and then you're just, it, it's just not going to be a good result. I would like to thank you for all your videos. You have already helped me, but in the serve, I'm not so not a good student. Just keep working. You got it. You got it. What determines the direction of the ball? How can I hit the ball to the place where I want? Well, the ball ultimately goes where you point your strings. That is ultimately what sends the ball where it goes. Now, there is incidence and reflection. So we don't want to lose the fact that the ball does come at one angle and leave another angle. But the vast majority of directional control simply comes from where you're pointing your strings. So what you have to practice is the ability to make the ball go places. So for instance, right, I can take a foam ball and I can try to hit right here. So if just look where this is, right, it's about a foot over. So I'm going to try to hit right there. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. So I just hit a foot so I'm hitting along that edge of the door. Now I'm gonna to aim to the right, right? So the ball goes, the ball goes where you want it to go. So the first thing you gotta have is a place you want the ball to go. Have a place you want the ball to go. That's number one. Then you wanna practice as something so simple as take a foam ball and hit a wall and have a target. So like right here, I'm gonna to try to hit right here. So look where that is, and I'm going to try to hit right there. Not bad. It was a little low. It was a little low. Do I have another ball? Here we go. But I know this is funny, but the ball truly goes where you want it to go, and, but you have to point the strings there. Another thing that you got to focus on is not using a lot of wrist. You can think of it this way. I think I have a coin here. Here we go. Think of it this way. Take a, a coin and put it on the edge of your racket and then move your racket forward through the hitting zone without letting the coin fall off. Players who get very wristy tend to not have a long enough contact zone, which means they're rolling the, the racket like this or they're flicking the wrist like this. You wanna to try to keep your strings facing towards your target for as long as possible. So have a, have a target, practice hitting that target, and just know that the longer you keep your strings facing that target, then the more likely you're gonna hit your target. Let's see here. Transition from an Eastern to a modified Eastern a couple months ago. Uh, should I make the change to a semi-Western? No, I don't think so. Agassi was in between an Eastern and a semi-Western. He was in between, so no, he was pretty good. 
uh, what grip is best for a top spin on a one hand and backhand? So Maria, um, placing your hand all the way on top of the racket. So remember, we have these two spots on the hand and we want to use panel number one, which is the very top. So imagine driving down the road and you see someone sitting on a stop sign, <laughs> you know? So you want the racket on its edge. This is a stop sign, this is an octagon, and we wanna have uh, our knuckle and heel pad, both of those spots on the very top of the racket. Now, the reason players don't hit topspin on the one-hander isn't just because of the grip. It's also because they do not close the racket face. So if you wanna hit better topspin, you have to make sure that you tilt your strings down and spin the ball rather than having your racket straight up and down like you could take a coin and then hitting flat or worse, the racket face opens and the ball goes out. So really turn the racket. You could think of it as take the back of your hand and tilt the back of your hand toward the ground. So when you use an Eastern backhand, as the racket drops, tilt the back of your hand down or you can use your non-hitting hand and go palm down, tilt the palm down toward the ground. That tilts the strings to the ground and then makes it very easy to spin up the back of the ball. We wanna make that ball roll over itself for topspin. So use the, the grip, but also close the racket face. Let's keep going. Doo, doo, doo. Uh, Johnny Mac said, all good volleys have a hint of slice. Agree. Um, no. <laughs> uh, so high, so I, I agree with the hint. I like that. Uh, you're welcome, Maria. Um, I like that a lot. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for the tip. You're amazing. Thank you, Pontus Schroeder. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so when it comes to volleys, think of it this way. The higher the volley, the flatter you should hit the volley. So the higher the volley, the flatter. The higher the volley, the flatter. The lower the volley, if the ball is um, like pretty fast, you wanna take a little speed off of it, then if you wanna put a little underspin on it to help break up the speed, especially if the ball has some top spin, um, then that's a good idea. But if the ball's pretty slow, you can actually hit pretty flat and you're gonna be good. So in my experience, people put way too much spin on their volleys and they set the racket up here and they go down. They set the racket up here and they go down. What I want you to do is hit through the volleys. Now, what I recommend is actually a grip change. It's funny, when I'm like, I'm considered a heretic in the, in the teaching community because I don't teach what's conventionally taught, which is one grip. And you've got to have one grip on the volleys. I think that's absolute bunk. And anybody who tells me that there's not enough time to change the grip, I know they've never tried it because there is enough time, 95% of the time. And the 5% of the time when you're playing doubles and there's an overhead getting crushed at you, then don't change your grip and you're just like everyone else. Um, you wouldn't say to a friend um, who stops for coffee on the way to school or way to work, you wouldn't say to them, hey, you're not always gonna have time to do that. You'd be like, okay, well, when I don't have enough time, I won't stop for coffee, but this morning I'm gonna stop for coffee. It's, it's, it's a situational thing. If the ball is slow, especially like a high backhand, change your grip a little bit farther. It doesn't have to go all the way to an Eastern backhand, but a little bit past a continental. And then you can hit much flatter into the back of the ball. So yes, uh, is a hint of backspin a good thing to have? Yes. Uh, no more than a hint. But do all good volleys have to have underspin? No, because the ball up here is not going to be hit with underspin. It's going to be hit flat. Thank you so... Hey, what's up, Jason? Um, okay, here we go. Uh, when you said aim higher over the net, does it mean to open the racket face past neutral, which is called square? What's up, TM? Good to see you. You're someone who comments on my videos a lot. Um, if not, how does racket face change compared to aiming lower? Yes. So when you aim higher over the net, you will have your racket face, especially like in a, even if it's going to be like a top spin lob, you have to have your racket face open like this. But also understand, Jason, it is also based on the drag from the direction you're swinging. So let me explain, Jason. Let's say your racket face is two degrees open at contact and you swing 
perpendicular to the racket face, right? So, or, or, or like, like this, like the angle, right? So my racket is open at two degrees and my swing is up at two degrees and the ball leaves the racket going up at two degrees, right? Well, if I now have the two degrees open, but now I swing very much up and I swing very much like more upward compared to where the strings are pointing, then the ball is not gonna go two degrees. It's gonna go higher because there's drag. There is drag that's gonna send that ball up. So it is based on yes, an open racket face, but also how much up you are swinging and the, the, the dwell of the racket pulling the ball up. But if you think of it as the racket face being open or closed, that's fine, but I still want you to swing up as you're hitting the ball even low over the net. You can have your racket a few degrees closed as you're hitting it low and a few degrees, a few degrees open if you're gonna hit like a topspin lob. If your racket face is straight up and down and you swing up a lot, the ball's gonna go slightly up off the racket, so that ball's gonna go higher. Let's see, why do Americans always paint their banisters two different colors? Um, we, I didn't paint those. I don't know. I didn't do any of the painting here. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I wish you could see what's behind the camera. Everyone's like, he needs to buy furniture. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like we have a full finished basement in like living space. It's that this is the area my wife gave me. Um, I really do need to paint this, but um, I, you know, the motivation I have to paint, but uh, why are the banisters two different colors? Uh, I don't know. That's just the, the railing is, is wood stained and then the, the, the spindles are painted white. So I don't know. <laughs> it's so funny. I never thought of it. Uh, what is the best position when serving in singles? Very close to the mark uh, at the center or like four feet towards the opposite side you're serving to? Okay, James, great question. And I'm going to say yes and even more so. Let me explain. You want to change where you're standing when you serve. You don't want to stand in the same spot every time. Now, here is where I get, and for all of you who, um, who gave a super thanks and like a super chat, super sticker, or whatever it's called when you made a comment, thank you so much for the donations. Incredible. It means the world to me and my family. When I suggest this, I always get into like a Twitter war with people. But players who actually do it on the court realize the benefit. So when you are serving, James, you should serve the vast majority of the time, let's say three feet, four feet, that's fine, right? So like right about here, okay? If you want to stand here just to be able to hit more to the T, that's great. But don't forget once or twice a match to stand out there. Now, Here's what always happens. People always say, but Ryan, you're going to serve and they're just going to blast it down the line. It doesn't happen. And the reason is your opponent is not used to the ball coming in at this angle. And what they end up doing is trying to hit down the line, but they end up not having enough angle or just hitting it to the middle. And then what ends up happening is because you were out here, you were able to push them off the court. Now when they hit to the middle, now you can go into the open court. Please try this because I've made videos on this before and it's, it's funny. I always get the comments, oh, if you ever tried that against me, like people talking like they're Pete Sampras or Roger Federer, um, it just doesn't, it just simply doesn't happen. And when your opponent tries to rip it down the line, they end up missing and it, it's just what happens. So. Uh, try using all of those positions, James, and you're going to see a big difference in how you kind of confuse and force errors from your opponent on the return. You love my enthusiasm. Thank you so much. I love, love coaching. Let me just get a quick sip of water. I love coaching. Where is it? Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see what we got here with the questions. Show us the damage to your ceiling and walls. Um, I actually was filming a video the other day and I put a black mark onto one of the drop tiles in the ceiling, um, but it's not very exciting. I love listening to the podcast. Thanks, Vivek. I 100% today will upload another video, uh, another uh, episode. I gotta, I, I record them when I drive, by the way. I just drive and I talk into my phone. I use an app called Anchor 
like think of an anchor coming from a boat. It's the name of it. Um, and so you can just create like free podcasts and they're awesome. Super cool live chat. You just made an impact on a lot of people today. Jeez. And you did too, Jim, in me. So thank you so, so much. You got it, James. I hope that helps with where you're standing when you serve. Thank you for the support. Unbelievable. Uh, do, do, let's go a little bit back here. I want to, uh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to look at some of the questions here. If you have a question, please th throw it in. Uh, thanks coach. I can execute all the uh, pieces of the serve, but I can never put them all together. Any hints? Uh, oh, I joined so late. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. And for any of you watching, it means the world to me. If you do put in a super thanks or a super chat or a super sticker, I don't even understand it all. Um, but you can, when you go into the comment, if you're going to comment, you'll see it there. Um, how to put it all together. One of the things I would say is to film yourself. You know, what person, like how many of you have filmed yourself in the last month playing a match, hitting serves, hitting forehands, hitting backhands? Um, there's a saying, people believe what they see, not what they hear. You know, it's funny, before cell phones, before cell phones, I used to um, like get in arguments with people because I'd tell them, hey, uh, you know, you're, um, you know, you're doing this on your serve or on your forehand and they'll, they'll, they'll get in like an argument with me. So now with every, not, you know what I mean by that? They, they, they disagree. And now I just show them. So the beauty of video is you're going to pick up things that you didn't know about your own game. So a lot of people, they think they move their feet a lot and then they video themselves playing a set and they go, oh my gosh, I never moved my feet at all. You know, we have this perception of what we look like playing tennis and we think it looks like, you know, Nick Kyrgios and JJ Wolf who are going to play tonight, which I cannot wait for that match. Uh, it's going to be an exciting match. Um, uh, but that's what we think we look like. We think we look like JJ Wolf and Nick Kyrgios, but... In actuality, I think sometimes people are shocked when they first see themselves. Uh, so I want you to make sure you're, all of you are filming yourself. And, you know, somebody talked about, you know, I can get certain pieces of the serve, um, but, but I can't put it all together. That's okay. Maybe not try to put all the pieces together. Film yourself and just pick one thing, one thing that's like glaringly obvious that you see about your serve and just work on that rather than trying to do all the pieces of the, of the puzzle. Because oftentimes it can just be paralysis by analysis. I teach a lot of things, but again, you don't, like when you go to the grocery store, you don't have to buy everything. You see it and it's an option and it's available to you, but you don't need to buy it. And, and so that's kind of how my instruction is. You do not have to use every single piece of information I teach. Just use what is gonna help you. That's all I want. Uh, hi, Coach Ryan, I have a match in a few hours. What do you suggest I do for a warm up? Oh my gosh. So you need to actually warm up and like get your body warm. Um, you know, like, please don't go out on the court. And the first thing you do is you hit a tennis ball as you warm up, whether it's jump rope, whether it's jumping jacks, whether it's just light jogs, you actually need to physically move for 10 minutes and be warm before you ever hit a tennis ball. Uh, really need your advice on this, please. Single hand backhand is not working for me trying since two years. Can I switch to a two-handed backhand? Absolutely. 100%. Just, you got to make sure the top hand is now your driving hand. So the, the, the left hand is the, or your top hand, if you're right-handed, your top hand, your left hand is going to be the hand that's now swinging. You're so used to having the lead shoulder do the swinging now you got to think of the back shoulder. So you got to really turn the hips and you got to really think of the top hand as the hand that's controlling. There's Lubacic uh, YouTube clip of him serving with one foot in the court before serving, but making contact with both feet on the ground in the court. Is that legal? If he is hitting the ground and then making contact with the ball, not allowed. If he's hitting the court, if he's hitting the court. Any tips for reducing nerves at the start of a match and what to do when you feel like your play is starting to enter a slump? Uh, Marcus, yeah. So first off, one thing that can absolutely help you with nerves is making sure that you actually have a game plan. So for all of you watching, let me give you one singles tip and then I'm gonna have to go. And by the way, for all of you, I think um, 
There were like six or seven of you who left a super thanks. So I really, really appreciate it. That's the small tip that people were leaving. Um, that means the world to me. Uh, so it's, it's not a small tip. Uh, it's, it helps me tremendously. So thank you so much. Um, but here's one tip that you can have per idea, right? Or per, per phase of the game. <laughs> you are so energetic. Thanks. I love coaching. That's why I have so much energy. I, I get so excited to do these lives. Um, it's just, I, I, I was meant to be a tennis coach, not necessarily for the impact I can make, but for me to be a happy person. Like I, I was meant to do this. I wanted to be a tennis coach since I was 12 years old. It was like the thing I wanted to do. So there are five phases of a tennis point, serving, returning, rallying, you're coming to the net and your opponent is coming to the net. Let me give you one tip per phase of the game and you are absolutely going to win more matches with these five tips. First off, the serve, stop missing your serve wide. No more are you gonna miss wide serves. You are going to aim to the center more often because unless you are hitting 120 mile an hour serves, serving to the T and out wide is too risky. Now, if you can serve 120 and 130 like Nick Kyrgios, then serving out wide and serving down the tee becomes uh, the like an ace. But if you're hitting 60, 70, 80 miles an hour and you're aiming down the tee and out wide, what ends up happening is you're just hemorrhaging points because you're just missing serves after serve. So my first tip for you is to get a high percentage of your first serves in the court. Now, second serve should be aimed there anyway. Do not be aiming down the tee or out wide on second serves. But first serve, try to get at least 65% of your first serves in. And you're going to do that by serving right to the body. Doesn't have to be hard. Just serve right to the person. Seems counterintuitive. It seems like it'd be too easy. But really, it takes the pressure off you because you're not having to hit a ton of second serves. Tip number two, the return. Remember, there are five phases of tennis. And when you're taking lessons, you, your coach should be teaching those five phases to you and what you should be working on. When it comes to the return, if you have a singles match coming up, I want you aiming, so this is your opponent, I want you aiming the return back down the middle. I want you to watch how often at the US Open, the return is hit to the center third of the court. So right here, this is the left third, this is the center third, this is the right third. Watch how often, like tonight, Kyrgios is playing J.J. Wolf. Watch how often the Kyrgios serve comes in and J.J. Wolf hits it back down the middle. There's very little difference, in my opinion, between double faults. Jim! Okay, Jim, you're cut off now. No more. <laughs> Thank you so much. But that's it. No more. No more. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Jim. That means the world to me. Yeah, I know. Oh, got to sign off. Thank you, Jim. You're the best. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Jim. Jim gave, t uh, Jim donated, I think $15 to this live stream. You are amazing, Jim. Thank you so, so much. Uh, yeah. And I cannot wait for that match tonight. JJ Wolf and, and Kyrgios. Watch how often they return to the middle. Cause there's very little difference between double faulting and missing the return. I don't really see a difference. The first touch you had on the ball, you ended the point with an error. So when it comes to returning serve, watch how often the pros return down the middle. They try to center the opponent. Watch how often the ball is hit to the outside thirds and this player, the server, gets the returner in trouble. Returning down the middle. <laughs> you should write a tennis book. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Steve, Jacob. Thank you so much. Um, watch how often they return down the middle to neutralize the point. So I want you to copy that. We have in our minds that the returners are just crushing the ball to the corners. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, just tonight when you're watching tennis at the U.S. Open, just keep track of where the return is hit. Is the return hit to the center third? Like where does the ball land? Does it land in the center third, in the deuce third, in the add third? So just do that. Go deuce, center, add. And just do little check marks, right? 
little check marks. And every time, yeah, I have the, the uh, I have a copy of his book. It's awesome. So you're 100% right. Ian's Essential Tennis book is awesome. And you'll notice that at the end of the match, more returns went down the middle than any of the other sides. So return down the middle, huge difference. All right, tip number three. We are going to serve more to the body to get a higher percentage in. We're going to return to the body to get more of our returns in. When it comes to rallying, here's a simple idea. Be the person on average who hits higher over the net. Be the person on average who hits higher over the net. We have in our mind that the person who hits lower is the person who's better and giving their opponent fits. Nothing could be further from the truth. I've had a few people in this live stream ask me, how do you deal with high balls? You know what no one's asked? How do I deal with mid thigh, knee level and shoulder level balls? You know why? Because no, no one struggles with those shots. We have to figure out how to make our opponent uncomfortable. And what we can do is write a list of the things that make us uncomfortable. So if we get uncomfortable when our opponent hits high balls, then what we need to do is give our opponent that, right? The, the golden, you know the golden rule, do unto others as you want them to do to you? The golden rule of tennis is do unto others as you don't want them to do to you. You need to treat people the way you don't want to be treated. People don't like high backhands, especially one-handers. People generally don't like the ball out of their strike zone. They want the ball nice and low and comfortable. So don't hit fast and low or you're giving them the ball they want. Hit some arcing shots. Doesn't have to be ripped with spin. Just don't crush it. Just hit a little higher over the net than you normally do. The ball will land deeper. It'll push them back. Then they've got a high ball and they'll drive it into the net. It's just so easy to get people uncomfortable by hitting the ball higher over the net. So we're talking about five single strategies that you can use to win your next match. Serving, returning, rallying when you go to the net and when your opponent goes to the net. We just talked about serving to the body more. We talked about returning to the body more. And it, and it comes to um, the, uh, sorry, uh, UTR of 955. And then hitting the ball higher over the net. Here's a tip that's going to help you when you are going to the net. When you get a short ball and you hit the ball as an approach shot and you're coming forward, you must split step. People, good Sylvia, people do not split step. So imagine this, right? Imagine you're driving down the road in your car and a sharp turn is coming, a very sharp turn. What are the two things, what are the two ways you are going to control the car to make that really sharp turn? Can anybody tell me in the comments? What are the two things you are going to use Shakur, thank you so much. You're amazing. You made a, um, so much of a difference in my tennis. Thank you so much. You're incredible. I've seen so many of your comments in my videos. Thank you so much. This has been unreal. All these super chats, super thanks, super stickers. Again, I'm like the worst YouTuber in the world. I know none of this stuff. I, um, you use the brakes and, and I'll give you the easy one, the steering wheel. So Hazemaker, awesome. That's the one that people forget. They forget that you need to hit the brakes to make sharp angles. So let me show you this. I, I did this drill with a guy this past Saturday, this exact drill. I had him just hit, and I can just use my Top Spin Pro here. We were on the court, I fed him a short ball, he came in, he hit an approach shot, and he had to go like this. And then he ran back, I fed him a short ball, I'll use the Top Spin Pro as the ball. He ran in, and he had to split step. If you are not split stepping as your opponent hits, then what you end up doing is going too fast around a corner. Because when you're going forward, you're gonna have to change direction. If the ball comes at you, try to get out of the way. If the ball's to your left, if the ball's to the right, if you're running forward, thank you, Marcus. <laughs> My friend loves the birthday hat stuff. Here, I'll wear it as I, um, as I finish up this live. Thank you so much, thank you so much. When you're running forward, you know a lot of people, they get lobbed because they hit the approach shot and they start running forward and then they just run as the lob goes over your head. If you're running 
as your opponent is hitting the ball, how do you know if you're running in the right direction? You want to be stationary as your opponent hits the ball, or mostly stationary. You want to jump in the air, and the proper timing is actually to be in the air as your opponent strikes the ball. Let me just see what time it is. All right. I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to be going live on Instagram <laughs> in probably about a half an hour if you want to join me over there because I got to go pick up my kids from school. Um, so join me on Instagram and tell me, I was on your live on YouTube. I th I, that would be awesome. If you're running as your opponent hits the ball, chances are you're not running in the right direction. And then you're going too fast. Somebody just said you got to hit the brakes when you make a sharp turn. So when you hit the approach shot, split step. And by the way, the split step is not up here. When you hit an approach shot and you approach, the time it takes for your ball to get to your opponent, it's very little time. You're only going to get to here, and then you've got a split step. If you keep running and they hit cross court, to get there is going to be a wide turn. You want to split step and be able to make a sharp directional change. That's the benefit of the split step. So, in... It, Thank you so much. Unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. You changed my tennis dramatically. Loved your coaching. Thank you for the super thanks from Korea. Unbelievable. Thank you so, so much. That means the world to me. Thank you for the tip. I really, really appreciate it. When you split step, you can get to more balls because you can change direction more quickly and sharply. It's no different than hitting the brakes where you're going to make a sharp turn. All right. Last thing, guys, and then I've got to go uh, pick up my kids from school. But somebody was talking about the birth they had, so I decided to wear it. Uh, please, this is the best money you'll spend on improving your serve. Just toss the ball, knock off a birthday hat, and you will get rid of your waiter's tray. I invented that back in 2014, the birthday hat serve. The last thing, your opponent comes to the net. When your opponent comes to the net involve them in the point. When your opponent comes to the net, involve them in the point. And what I mean by that is hit the ball to them. Hit the ball right to them. Let spin and gravity bring the ball to their feet. So when they're coming in, just give them a low ball. This is what I call the two shot passing shot strategy. It should take you two shots to pass them because the first shot is going to be at their feet. Then they pop it up. Now you come in and you go for the pass. See, when your opponent comes to the net on you, they typically hit a shot that gets you running, right? You're running off the court and you're in trouble. I call that a red situation. If you're in a red situation, it is not in your best interest to go for a green shot. A green shot is a winner. A green shot is where you're trying to end the point and beat them. That means you're trying to avoid them. Do not avoid your opponent when they're coming in. Involve them in the point. The chances of winning the point go up when you involve the opponent. So you hit it right to them. By the way, most people do not split step. Most of your opponents, we just talked about, like, why am I suggesting that you need to split step when you go to the net? Because I know I've been coaching for 25 years, started teaching June 15th, 1997. Most tennis players do not split step, which means most of your opponents don't split step. So when you hit it low to them, they run into it, they screw it up, they're completely off balance. People hate low volleys. So again, do unto others as you don't want them to do to you, the golden rule of tennis. If they miss it, great. If they make it, it's going to be a pop-up. Now you're in a green situation. Now you're in a green situation and you can go for the pass because you can step inside the court. They're stuck around no man's... Oops, man down. Oh, I'm losing everything. Man down. And all of a sudden, now you have the advantage and you can go for the pass. So... Five singles tips to end you with. Serving, returning, rallying. You go to the net and your opponent goes to the net. Serve to the body more often to get more serves in. Return to the body to get more returns in to be more consistent. Plus cut off the angles they have for their serve plus one. When it comes to rallying, be the person who hits higher over the net on average. Of course you need to vary it. 
but if you could just have an average height that you are hitting over the net, be slightly higher than your opponent. You'll hit the ball deeper, you'll hit the net less, and incidence equals reflection, so the ball will bounce higher and stay out of their strike zone. When you're going to the net, split step around the service line, just past the service line, making sure you're not moving when they hit, that way you can change direction if needed. And when your opponent comes to the net, hit to their feet. Woo, all right, I gotta go, I gotta go get my kids. Uh, I'm part husband, part dad, part tennis coach, but I am 100% someone who is passionate about helping you all gain confidence, <laughs> win more matches, and play much better tennis. To all of you who watched and stayed with me throughout this, thank you so, so much. To so many of you who left a super, t a super chat, super thanks, super sticker, whatever, um, it means the absolute world to me. There were some amazing donations to the channel today, which mean the world to me. If there's a video that you'd like to see, I try to make two a day. I try, I do my best to make it. Uh, thanks Vivek, I really appreciate it. Uh, please write it in the comments, uh, in any of my videos, because I do check the comments. Um, but please just write uh, uh, in the comment section a video that you'd like to see. So thank you all so much. I absolutely love this. We were on here for an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Halil. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you follow me on, uh, you got it, Hayden. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, make sure that you split step, of course. Oh, by the way, I have so many people saying, hey, have you made this video? I've made so many videos on YouTube. I make more content than anyone else. Uh, so go on YouTube in the search bar and just type two minute tennis and then write the topic. And you'll probably see a video come up on that topic. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And you got this.